Hello, it's Scott Manley, and welcome to Kerbal Interstellar Quest, Episode 19. Jebediah Kerman is testing out the new gravity detector and aviation nose cone. The nose cone is now a, a science package. It's an atmospheric analyzer, and uh, yeah, he's off analyzing all this stuff to basically collect all the science from the biomes around the Kerbal Space Center. Now, I know there's a, there's actually quite a few that are very close nearby. You can, uh, of course, get the launch pad. You can get the, the space center, the shores, the oceans, the grasslands, the highlands, and the mountains, all really close to Kerbal Space Center. You can get a decent amount of science. Although, beware that the uh, the values in those windows were way higher than what I actually gave back for some of these uh, science measurements. It appears to be a bug with the nose cone and the gravity detector. Anyway, continuing with the theme of science, we have... The Moho probe, the Moho spacecraft, has to make a correction burn. And if you remember, I scheduled that a, you know, back when uh, I launched it. So we're now making this maneuver. We're dropping its periapsis, fly past distance, oh, to almost twenty kilometers. That is a, that is a nice close encounter. Hopefully, it will be close enough that we can get ourselves captured into an orbit. Hopefully, we'll have enough delta v. Meanwhile, you may be wondering uh, what happened with the. Sean's return? Well, uh, the aviation team are being rather secretive. They're off in Hangar 18 investigating his capsule. Also, I realized there was another science opportunity which I haven't yet exploited. And uh, more or less sending the same spacecraft that I was going to send to Moho. Although now we have a couple of extra instruments. If I'd delayed the Moho launch by a few days, I could have got those extra instruments. I could have sent the the gravity detector being the main thing. But now we can send the gravity detector on a mission to uh, a body which many people manage to forget when they're going after science. Yes, you can send science missions to the sun. Now uh, you can get, you have to get into low stellar orbit there and oh dear, that was a mistake. I did not mean to do that. Yes, uh, launching without the fairing will probably slow me down a whole lot, but uh, hopefully I can maintain. Oh, I can maintain control. I do not know. I remember launching this, but this is all post commentary, so you know you completely can call me out on it. Yeah, that. Uh, I remember this thing being terribly hard to fly because if I deviated too far from the, uh, too far, then it wanted to flip over. Also, yes, giant radar dish had a nasty habit of making the spacecraft want to rotate. But uh, regardless, we uh, just basically put ourselves into a, a retrograde orbit and try to burn as much fuel as possible in that direction, try to pick as much velocity as possible. There's a bit of uh, remote tech management that you need to do to make sure that you're uh, on the correct satellite. That uh, lower stage will, of course, shoot off into... Uh, you know, interplanetary space and hopefully won't come back and hit us anywhere where it matters. Uh, but this one now we have a we have another stage here which is going to be that a uh, that a uh, double length tank and of course the KW rocketry upper stage motor which gets really good specific impulse 400 ISP largely because it's long and thin although it doesn't have a huge amount of thrust. Now we're trying to get our periaps down probably below a million. I'm not sure what the threshold is for the, the sun. But uh, yeah, I think we're pretty close there. If that doesn't turn out to be low Kerbin or low Kerbal orbit, then we shall perhaps have to make some adjustments. But regardless, this spacecraft is shooting off into deep space and well, it has a long way to go. It probably will get there before the one gets to Moho, but it won't have to perform any course corrections. There, we'll set ourselves a little... We'll set ourselves a timer. What are we going to do? It's the... Yes, periaps. We want to set a periaps timer. And that is going to be 19 days away. So uh, it'll get there. It'll get there before we get to Moho, which is a... You know, means we'll need to remember it. Kerbal alarm clock, excellent thing to have around. People ask me how I was timing my launch windows and I'm using Kerbal alarm clock, which is approximate. It's an approximate system, but it's good enough. This sensor monitors the orbital dynamics of the planets and finds that they are not consistent with physics because they're only following two body orbits. Don't get me started. 
I think we need a proper hybrid symplectic integrator, he says, going off into deep science stuff. No, seriously, um, yeah, we go. this thing will be going off and doing its stuff. Meanwhile, we come back to the other launch window that we're about to have. Dual, the dual launch window is seven days away. We're now with dual. The launch windows are actually pretty wide. You have a lot of opportunity to adjust these things. So... This is my Joule probe, and if you remember, if you know anything about Kerbal Space Program, you'll know that Joule actually has lots of moons, so this is a more complex space probe than I have built so far. I am not going to send a manned mission to Joule because it is so far away. It, uh, and, and really, although I could load up enough life support on this thing, to on a spacecraft, to keep a crew alive, I kind of think that's what's missing, and maybe there's a mod for this, but I'd really like a mod that uh, makes sure that if you send a Kerbin or Kerbal on like a 100 day mission that you give them more than a single capsule to live in. Anyway, uh, also in the right bottom right you'll see I'm using Flight Engineer again, that is, that is working right now, and to be honest I much prefer flying a launch using Flight Engineer so I can watch the, the Apo apps and the Perry apps. Uh, that way I don't need to keep sitting in the map mode and I can actually admire the gorgeous graphics of this game as I head off into the sky at over Mach 1, propelled by a controlled bomb, essentially. Yeah, there goes the solid rocket boosters and now our thrust is a little lower. It's barely accelerating us. That's uh, almost realistic, actually, you know. Re uh, that happens quite often. A lot of spacecraft, after they ditch their boosters, they can barely manage 1G acceleration, but they already have enough momentum that they're able to slip the bonds of Earth and head off to explore infinities and beyond. Oh, it sounds so, so poetic. Sounds so poetic, does it not? Well, actually, I'm just copying it from someone that knows English better than myself. I tend to be a reader of Burns, if you ask me, and I don't think Robert Burns wrote a great deal about rockets. Okay, he wrote more about whiskey and farming and the tax man. So yeah, uh, my trick when I'm using Kerbal Engineer is to more or less try to get the time to Apple apps up to around 40 seconds and then try to keep it below one minute. And that uh, provides a pretty good gravity turn if you follow that profile, depending on your acceleration. Anyway, this mission is probably the most complex mission I've flown, or the most complex unmanned mission that I've had to fly in part of this series so far. Now, it is a three-part probe. There is a central probe, which carries uh, instruments that can be used from space. It has a high-gain antenna, which should be able to communicate back with the planet Kerbin all the way out at Joule. But it also has two uh, smaller satellites, which uh, it's going to deploy. These are atmosphere probes. They have little heat shields, and they are intended to land on Joule and Lathe. And they should ideally collect atmospheric science and uh, then science when they're on the ground. Hopefully they won't just burn up and provide us a nice light show because that would be a waste of, you know, millions of Kerbal dollars, whatever. What was the name that they have came up with for that? I, I believe the devs uh, alluded to something and then never told me. Regardless, yes. Uh, yeah, so the main, the entire probe is going to have to... Uh, relay, like the main probe is going to have to relay the data, so I'm going to have to make sure that they do their atmospheric uh, descent close to the main probe, which is going to be interesting. Uh, I don't actually know what configuration things will be in, but we'll find out. Anyway, we're getting ready to ditch this stage and... Bang! Now you can see there's magnificent work of probe art as it burns its uh, poodle engine, propelling it towards inter interplanetary space. So yeah, you can see it has it has these uh, dishes on there. Uh, of, of dubious, there's a bit of part clipping going on there, but I didn't have to actually use part clipping for it to happen. But yeah, the antenna are a dish antenna because of course they're going to be falling through the atmosphere and I want them to be able to use their antenna while falling. Uh, the large, there's a large antenna on the front there that's all folded away, that, that's the one that has range. There are heat shields on these little probes and hopefully they will function sufficiently well and we won't lose the parachutes because we all know how you know often I like to use my, lose my parachutes. If I lose parachutes then it probably means that I will only get atmospheric science. 
one way or another, I want to get as much science as I can from this mission, and it will be beamed back and repeated and beamed back again. Uh, we The power supplies for these things are all nuclear as well. That main spacecraft actually has one of the uh, little nuclear reactors and a nuclear generator, a couple of radiators. And all that is, of course, powering a standard Kerbal Ion engine, which will perform uh, course corrections and trims and make sure that it can maneuver within the dual system. Most of the impulse will actually be provided by gravity assists inside the dual system. So there will no doubt be lots of fun as I uh, spend all my uh, time making very, very slow burns and then screw them up by flying through the wrong, you know, atmospheric window or whatever. We'll find out. It will be a great entertainment as a, and hopefully result in something burning up in the atmosphere for your entertainment. Or uh, it might just all work out, but you never really want that to happen because when things happen perfectly, then I start to feel smug. And you don't want to have me being smug. I need some humility in there. Really, the only reason I'm good at Kerbal Space Program is because I, you know, studied astronomy at university. So I actually have an idea about, uh, you know, how spacecraft fly in space, and most people don't. Uh, you know, I'm rubbish at other games. This is why you can, you know, if you could go to university and study like RimWorld, then I might actually be good at that game. Okay. So, it's, we're, what we're doing here is we're going to burn downwards, so I'm just kind of reducing the eccentricity of my orbit. I don't want to really raise my orbit anymore, I want to take advantage of uh, the good old Oberth effect. Um, I'm going to come around on the right side of the plant, so it should actually help us. There we go. Now, time to get in and start analysing those orbits. I'm going to set myself a manoeuvre, add a manoeuvre. Um, add there it is there so I want to go slightly okay I want to go slightly there add maneuver thank you now I need to try and figure out where I'm gonna burn and old me leaves and new me comes here as I spend a few minutes watching myself uh, plot this orbit so uh, let me see what's going what did I do back here oh yeah so you see that the because of the position of the ascending and descending node I kind of try to adjust my orbit so that I come in relatively close. So here's the thing. If you're flying out and you're missing, it's really good to drag the node back and forth. That will give you more control about where you actually end up. Also, note the fancy trick that I did there by putting the planet Kerbin in the way so that I don't get blinded by the sun and staring at it. Makes it easier to see things. Of course, that was also... Uh, preempted by me uh, losing the maneuver node. I keep on losing the maneuver node. It'd be really nice to have like a button that says restore the maneuver node that you just deleted because you were, you know, fat fingering it. Great feature request. Uh, make it so, devs, because I really have a lot of time losing maneuver nodes because I'm terrible at it. It's another, it, when I did astronomy at university, it did not include maneuver nodes as part of the curriculum. No, they were a new construction and they're very nice. I like them. Okay, we have our maneuver node and we are ready to burn off to infinity and beyond to more infinities because infinity isn't the biggest infinity. There's actually some infinities that are more infinite than infinity. Um, does that make sense? Like, it was a mathematics thing. Some infinities are more infinite than other infinities. Uh, go, and, go and look it up, right? It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be 2.2 kilometer per second burn, and we're going to split it here, and I screw it up. Actually, no, 3 minute 44, that's pretty close. Okay, we're going to overdo this a little. So note that we start burning down because we're just pointing directly at the blue uh, marker. This is going to be a long trip out there, and you see immediately that our periapse is, uh, well, actually our periapse is going down right now because we're burning down but that's okay our apoapse is rising carrying it inexorably towards the edge of the sphere of influence of Kerbin soon to pass into interplanetary space and then onwards to the vicinity of Jewel the green giant at the edge of the Kerbin system that uh, shines green in our night skies and you know 
is probably named after some god or something like that. I, I mean, actually, you know, they do talk about you know, gods making species in their own image. Obviously, the Kerbal's god is dual, right? Because it's green. All the other planets, they're like, you know, other non-green colors, you know? If uh, Eve was going to be their, you know, deity, they would be purple, right? No? Maybe? I don't know. Seriously? I don't know. Um, that that is a whole bit of like Kerbal theology I had not even considered at this time you know it, it's strange the stuff that I have learned in my time okay so now we are uh, yep 20 minus 21 seconds to the node of course we've completely moved the node by now I suspect we will end up burning more than two kilometers per second now we should it would be nice if we could uh, adjust our, our vertical plane distance a little but unfortunately that's not possible now let's take a look at this. We're going to take our reflectron and we're going to point it at ComSat 2 so we make sure we maintain connectivity. What we're doing is using one of the antenna on the satellites to make sure that we maintain a continuous uplink and we don't uh, you know, have everything shut off because that would be really... Uh, it would mess us up a little, right? Okay, how are we doing? Delta V is... We have 800 and something Delta V, so actually we are going to run, we're going to complete this maneuver and then we will barely have enough Delta V, well we won't have much Delta V left, so we'll use that small amount of Delta V to make our final correction and then ditch that stage, but that final correction will probably be way off in interplanetary state, uh, space. Uh, I'm not sure when, but we're going to Obviously, it's dual. You want to set this up for an aero braking maneuver because aero braking maneuvers are the most efficient way to get captured around dual. I have no idea what this will be like under aero braking. It could be that it skips through the atmosphere completely. I don't know what altitude I'm going to aero brake at. I might actually have to do some experiments in simulations, as in load up other copies, uh, other things, and see how how the aero braking works. Uh, it's also entirely possible with deadly re-entry that the entire spacecraft disintegrates and it's game over and I have a big giggle. Uh, as I said, you know, perfection is not necessarily the best thing to watch. So there we go. We have our encounter. It's a 2 million kilometer encounter. We will use our 100 meters per second plus to adjust that, hopefully get it as close as we can. Oh wait, we have 41 meters per second of delta V. Uh, I think that will be enough. I think 41 meters per second on a 200-day orbit should... Oh, uh, dear, 41... Uh, I, I can't do the math. Uh, 41 should be uh, 4 million meters. So... Oh, wait, no, we're going to need 500 days. Okay, so we're not going to be able to do uh, an aero-braking maneuver with this. We're going to have to burn the ion drive. Well, or fire the ion drive. You know, whatever. Well, I guess, um, I guess if we have, I guess we don't have any shielding on that stage. We can't rely on it. Regardless, uh, there is that beautiful big dish beaming the data back to the planet Kerbin. Unlike the Galileo space probe, this thing has unfurled successfully and is carrying high bandwidth data connections back to Kerbin. Is it? Yeah, you know, admires the planet for one last time or something like that. I I don't know. Whatever they're doing, they're probably they've probably got a disc on this side that has messages from your know, Werner von Kron, uh, Werner von Kerman. Sorry, uh, <laughs> carrying peace off to the outer solar uh, Kerbal system. Well, we're off into interplanetary space, and with that, I think it's time to uh, end this episode. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.